Hi, welcome back to Work in Progress. I'm Santi, and today we're going to be talking about microaggressions, and we have the usual team here, along with our guest, Sana. Thanks for joining us, Sana. Yes, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. So, um, would, some, would someone like to get started? Maybe we could talk about what microaggressions are exactly. Yeah, um, so this whole topic came up because of a couple of sessions ago, right? We were talking about toxic masculinity and one of the things that we were, we didn't have time for was to talk about like the, the actual examples of what leads to really egregious behavior and really egregious toxic masculinity. And that folded not only into a, you know, like a gender discussion, but also a racial discussion. And so we've been trying to get back to this you know, like concrete examples. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing Sana's uh, just input that she got while she was doing her research for her thesis. And then maybe just talk about some real life examples that we've all experienced um, and why not addressing them leads to this more egregious, you know, lack of accountability and, 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 and bigger issues. That's a good point. Thank you, Paula. Um, Sana, would you like to tell us a bit about your thesis? Yeah, um, so it was written in anthropology in the University of Iceland and my supervisor uh, was Kristin Lofstotir, anthropologist. And it's basically called, but where are you really from? So this is a question that I've received a lot growing up here. I'm Icelandic. My mom, she's Icelandic, but my dad, he's from Tanzania. I've never been there. And I need to think like twice when I'm locating Tanzania on a map, I actually need to like think, you know, okay, Eastern Africa, it's there. Yeah, okay, I know where it is, but I've never been there. So I consider myself to be Icelandic. Um, but yeah, and I'm raised by a single mom, but over the years, a lot of people, they have asked me like, um, in English here in Iceland, where are you from? Are you adopted? Is that your mom? And even like complimented me on my good Icelandic, like, whoa, you speak really good Icelandic and, and stuff like these kind of comments that make me wonder like, and why shouldn't that be the case? And people just like really don't seem to believe that I could be Icelandic. And in their mind, when they're asking me like, where are you from? Uh, the question isn't like, where in Iceland are you from? They aren't satisfied by hearing like, oh, Breitholt or Isafjörður or somewhere in Iceland. They want to know like why my skin is so dark, why it doesn't look like the rest of the skin of most people living here. So this is something that I had noticed with friends um, that also have brown or dark skin in Iceland and that are mixed, as you can call it. It's kind of a difficult term to use because race, it's a social construct. It doesn't have any biological truth to it because you can't divide people into different races. And, but it has a lot of social meaning. So when we're talking about someone being mixed and this is something that we know what it means, but at the same time, I just wanna address the fact that we can't talk about people belonging to different races. But this is something that, um, friends and people I knew they had also experienced. So this, uh, I decided that this would be the topic for my master's thesis. So I did a research and I talked to 15 individuals. They were 18 years old to 54 and it was nine female and six male. And women were kind of like, um, it was easier to get them to participate in the research. And I don't know if it's because um, they ended up having more to say about negative experiences or maybe because I am a woman and it was me that was asking people to come and speak to me. But I, yeah, the conclusion was kind of like women had experienced more of these kind of questions and more curiosity, even though um, yeah, the people I spoke to, they uh, knew what 
we were talking about this is something they all recognized in their life you know being different in this small homogeneous country and what what were some of the examples they used i mean we know we know like a lot of typical ones right um you know exclusionary language that uh men use towards women in the workplace or even just in social structures um you know that it's like the person the the white person um reaching for their wallet as a black person walks by them like what were some examples of of microaggressions that they surfaced when you were talking to them uh, like some of the women they talked about their hair when people wanted to touch their hair because it was so different and and also asking them just like um where they were from and kind of like oh you have such beautiful eyes they aren't Icelandic are they kind of like approaching a woman based on her looks and kind of like hey you look nice but it's like a kind of disguised question trying to and um, get information on where the person is from and and like oh and yeah kind of sexualized comments also and this is probably not a microaggression this is just like a big aggression like oh i don't have the i don't have the black belt and then a man he was like saying i haven't had sexual intercourse with a black woman before this is something that i need to like try and and this goes into the kind of uh stereotypes of uh, black woman mixed yeah fetishizing yeah right. yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of this, like, um, it was regarding these questions, where you're from, and it was regarding um, how the parents met. And it kind of like went into the discussion um, in Iceland regarding the Second World War when um, soldiers came here to Iceland, and there was this discussion like, um, Icelandic women shouldn't be with the soldiers, and it was called like, Outstanding, the situation, like it would be bad for Icelandic women to be with foreign soldiers. And um, one woman, she was talking about this comment, like her mother had received, like, was your mom in the situation? And even though this is something that happened in the Icelandic community many years ago, it's like drawing up the same conclusion of kind of ideas of pollution if white Icelandic women would step out of the kind of national I don't know national pool of suitable men or something like that so a lot of kind of sexualized racialized comments not towards just the women that had received kind of those comments but also uh, about their white mothers for having been with a black man And what about like some of the, like the, you said the men were harder to talk to for one reason or another. Um, what was some of the common themes with the discussions with the, with the guys? Yeah, it was like um, more women kind of like step forward, but um, what I found was interesting uh, was this kind of like, imaginary like in um, Iceland some of the people I spoke to they uh, talked about people in Iceland thinking that everyone that was mixed in Iceland must be related or must know, know one another and know each other and um, two guys they had experienced that um, someone had thought people thought they were um, this famous musician from the band Retro Stepson. And they don't look anything like that musician. The only thing they have in common is brown skin. Um, and also what I thought was interesting was um, some of the men they experienced being called the N-word. And um, yeah, uh, I find it really difficult to say it. I hope everyone knows what we're- Yeah, I don't think that that's necessary. <laughs> Yeah, uh, during sports games. So they were practicing sport and um, the audience was watching 
or someone in the game had like um, approached them or said that word towards them kind of like during the heat of the moment that was kind of how they explained that had happened like during the heat of the moment people get angry you're playing a game and things kind of like spiral out of control but um, they experienced it as something that happened in the game and not something as being racialized towards them out of hate or out of racial tension but just because this is something that um, white people could say to them to try and use against them um, during a sports game when they're mad or something but they didn't maybe like see it as oh this is racism but they saw it more as you know kind of like um, no this is just something that people grab this is the first thing they're going to grab when they're trying to settle the score with me or something like that. So I thought that was also really interesting how you kind of see the N word and how we use it and how it can be different regarding the setting maybe or something like that. How it seems to be maybe more acceptable even though people thought that it was wrong. Yeah, I, I got that notion. But at the same time kind of like, oh no, it just like happened in the heat of the, heat of the game. I'm kind of curious, or I guess I am curious about the stigma of white Icelandic women that date foreign men. I only know of it in the position that I'm a black woman with an Icelandic, a white Icelandic partner, I should say. And I'm always seen as like, this is good for you. Good on you. Like you did a good thing. So I'm always curious about, um, I guess, mixed children and white Icelandic women that have had children with men of color, because I wonder what, how they are viewed in Icelandic society? Yeah, the comments seem, um, they seem to be like negative comments towards the white woman and um, not towards like the mixed race children that I was talking to when they were young adults. And um, not, I mean, they were like mixed, mixed race children were considered just like cute and beautiful and like, um, even when she talked about like, oh, your kids are going to be so cute. You're so lucky. You're going to have like such cute mixed babies. But at the same time, um, people that I spoke to, they had told me about how their mothers had um, received those comments that I was talking earlier about. Like, and if I go deeper into that and um, being called like African queen and the N whore, um, I'm translating it now into English um, and in a comment section um, online as being like responsible for the um, decline of the white, what do you say, like white um, generation or white um, racial gene pool of sorts. Yeah, something like that, like on a, yeah. on a a news that was online and someone was commenting and then someone like replied and said that and somehow seemed to have figured out that she had been with a black man. So these ideas regarding, um, because I framed the thesis inside a, uh, regarding ideas like nation, nationalism, who belongs, who doesn't belong, us versus them and um, ideas versus like space invasion, space invaders, and, and um, yeah, kind of like if you have this sense of a community, like imagined communities, um, who doesn't belong in that community regarding to this kind of idea we have of it in our head and how it's being maintained. So these negative views were kind of like directed to the white woman um, as they had somehow seemed to be responsible for stepping out of the Icelandic yeah. nation, that makes sense. And um, even like one comment, then, uh, yeah, I didn't speak to the parents. I only spoke to the mixed individuals, but one woman, she said like her mom had received a comment like, oh, you could go home with the black man. Why can you go home with me? Something like that, you know, like, oh, you could already do that. Why can you just like, <laughs> yeah really sexualized kind of uh, yeah as if her choice and partner had anything to do with her choice and not having that person as 
the partner, right? Yes. You know, and I had, um, I have a few, a few friends here who have mixed race children and one in particular, I remember when I first met her and we really clicked like right away, she and I were just similar views on a lot of different things, but I found it, I just made note of the fact that she made a point to explain to me why she had had a black partner. And I didn't understand why she was explaining this to me, right? Like, she's like, yeah, you know, uh, people say that I had jungle fever, which is like a term I haven't heard since the 90s. Um, and I was just really surprised that like, you know, it had nothing I felt to do with me. It felt like it had something to do with like, this is probably something she's had to explain over and over again in this local society. Um, and I couldn't understand, couldn't understand why until I, I started to get to know her more and just kind of like the, the view of this rarity of, of dating somebody outside of the, whatever the Icelandic norm is. It's because <laughs> this is this is interesting because the first time that I understood there was a thing as race was when I was in the I want to say fourth grade, fifth grade, fifth grade. I don't know. I was young. I was like maybe eight or nine, nine or ten. I don't even remember anymore. But I do remember the incident. There was a girl that I happened to like. And we were, and I, we lived in the same neighborhood and uh, I walked her home from the bus and, and I was going to ask her to go see a movie with me and my friends. And I asked her and right before we got to her house, like a block before we got to her house, she said, I can't go with you because you're black. And she says, and don't walk up to my house. Don't walk up to my door with me. Like, just like that. Just like, you know, like it was, that was just, she said it so kind of matter of factly that it, it, it kind of struck me like, I didn't even understand what's going on. So I was like, all right, I'll see you tomorrow at school. And I walked away. It was the first time my stepfather's Italian and was, has been in my life since I was five. And, you know, here I am like nine or 10. And this girl that I liked had just said this to me. And I, no one had ever confronted me about the color of my skin before or that there was an issue. And I remember walking home, trying to understand what the hell she just said. And like, what, what, what does that mean? Like, what does that have to do with anything? I didn't, I just really, as a kid, it just didn't make any sense to me. And uh, I went home and I remember sitting down and talking with my mother about it. And my mother being strong black woman that she is. And she said, and she broke it down to me and I still didn't understand it. <laughs> I still didn't get it. Because the, the, the man who was in my house, my stepfather was white. And I literally didn't see color as a thing. I, I, I just saw people as people, but that, really messed me up for a long time because I just didn't understand why that was a thing. But, but it also became throughout my life in my young dating life that I grew up in a middle-class neighborhood that was predominantly white, but we had a lot of international people coming through, but it was predominantly white. Uh, my best friend, his, his mother was from Mexico and his father's white, uh, Irish, and um, another friend of mine, they were uh, Hispanic, Puerto Rican, and, and white. So there was a lot of mix going on, and none of that ever meant anything bad to me. But I noticed that for white girls, it was a thing. Like, it was put upon them early early like don't you bring you know this person home whatever like she was the first but she wasn't the last and I remember in my dating situation I asked a girl out she's like no you know she'd make an excuse or something and you know, my friend would be like no her pants are really 
you know, her parents are Irish or her parents are this or, and it was like, wow, man. And it was really the guys, the white guys I knew dated anybody. It was not anything. They didn't care who they, she was Hispanic, black. They didn't really, and it wasn't like they thought, oh, my mom's going to freak out. They didn't really care. They didn't care. But the girls, it was a thing. And then, of course, as I learned more about history, that's always been the thing. And it's like, you know, um, we, it's just the thing about, it's sort of a male dominant thing too. You know, there was a white guy, I was talking to a cute girl. I, there have been times where I've been talking to a cute girl and some guy I don't even know would just start getting aggressive with me. Like, I'm, I'm not even trying to get with this girl. I'm just talking to her because to them, it's like, you're, you know, you're choosing something that you shouldn't even be looking that way. It's sort of like the cap, I call it the Captain Kirk complex. Like Captain Kirk will screw anything, screw anything, yellow, green, whatever. And nobody ever says anything. But if it's, you know, if it's the woman, you know, then there's something else. But I think it's a male, white male dominate kind of thing too that goes on with that. I think maybe that, that also, kinda, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, ties into how we're, we are taught and socialized as women to, um, you know, we're supposed to have this worth um, and you should be very selective Virtue. who you have sex with. Of course, your virginity, but not just from then on, like you said, um, I think there's a stigma, maybe f I think it's a cultural thing, like white women in the U.S., you do not bring home a Black guy. This is very taboo. This is This can still be seen as very... Uh, you know, get um, guess who's coming to dinner? You know, that's a very popular movie in American culture with that exact scenario. So this is still very taboo in some senses in the U.S. I it, guess. Happens, it happens in all over black the world too. There, there are black families I know that you know if, if like if I I'm not in a completely black family, but if I went home and, and brought a white girl home, be like, who are you bring that white girl home? You know, like like you know. I've had that experience. My but the thing saying. about that is, <laughs> yeah. my, the thing about that is, though, is you got to remember, the the black community or in the United States has the whole Emmett Teal thing. It's like, and and there's a whole history of white women accusing black men of, yeah. you know, rape, and that becomes its own. Yeah, it's moms looking out for their sons' safety, and in a lot of respects. Yeah, so it, it comes down. And that, that always goes to the, you know, the stereotypes that a lot of white people are inundated with about black people. And I always thought you're taught to be afraid. You're taught to be scared. Like, you know, I've gotten on the elevator here in Iceland and had women like, and it's not, and it's like my wife who's white and Icelandic, it's, it's hard. It was hard for her to hear me say these things because she, it was nowhere in her mind. Like it just didn't exist in her mind. And I understand that. Like, cause like I said, when I was a kid and they told me about race, I didn't understand it. And she was like that at one point in our relationship where she was like, you're being too sensitive. And I was like, N no, no. <laughs> and I, and I, I was like, Kristen, I can walk into a room and, and no one has to say anything. And I can tell you a lot without without anyone opening up because eyes you cannot there's that song you can't hide your lying eyes you know because a person cannot hide if they feel something and and it's always in the eyes and i've had it at family functions that i've gone to and it's like what what bothers me is that it causes me to be schizophrenic because i'm thinking in myself like what's going on like yeah, I've had people look like, and I'm like, what happened? Well, oh, it's me. Oh, I, I didn't know. Okay. And then I'm like, well, what do you think? I'm, I'm thinking in my head, what do you think I'm going to do? Yeah! <laughs> I just don't, I, it just, and sometimes I do want to do that, to tell you the truth, but I don't. I don't think it makes you schizophrenic, but I do think that's a very, this is like one of those things, a black trauma thing that's, um, we all kind of develop because we we come, become socialized with this um, 
in our upbringing. And the same thing happened to me with my Icelandic partner um, on my US family side. My family is not so keen on me having a white partner. Uh, my mother is very vocal about this. Um, so there's that and my great grandmother uh, who is, she was in her, she was born in the thirties in North Carolina. And I remember I showed her a picture of me and my partner and she said to me, oh, this, this is very popular now, the mixing of races. And I just kind of laughed because this is only something a woman her age could say. And I mean, I understood what she meant, but I was like, oh God, man, you can't say that. And I mean, that's what it is. And in, in Iceland, you get the, the stares and your partner can't imagine. They're like, no, people, they don't know you. So why would they treat you differently? And then they see it for themselves. And um, I imagine it, they don't like it, of course, because this is someone you care about and they know how great you are as a person. So why should other people judge you for that? And I wonder, because there are microaggressions, um, but it seems to be in maybe since certain circles, certain social classes in Iceland. Um, and I guess this question is for everyone because I know Loive, you have children of color. What in what if um, if there are any that you received, you know, some microaggressions against yourself as a white woman who had children with a person of color, and I guess towards your children that maybe you had to learn about at that time when you had them. Yeah, absolutely. This is um, <laughs> nobody can prepare you for for you know what's to come when you um, uh, yeah when you have children who are of different race than you are. But um, because um, my oldest daughter was born in London, so I was there for the first three, four years of her life. Um, and like coming to Iceland, um, it was very different. I mean, <laughs> I remember th this sketch from um, uh, British comedian uh, Gina Yassere. She said that the British are expert at covert racism. <laughs> You know, so racism over there is, um, you know, it's it's kind of, it's weird. I mean, I can, um, like, uh, I mean, the English are covert about everything pretty much. It's just in their culture. I mean, for example, if they don't like something you're wearing or something, they will use the word interesting. Oh, interesting dress. You know, so this is a very good example of, um, how the English kind of, you know, how the English racism is. Because um, I, I, I mean, I can like, there's one uh, example that springs to mind. I was uh, walking in London um, uh, with my two girlfriends um, who are both black. One is uh, of Cuban descent and the other one is uh, of Jamaican descent. And we all had our children with us um, and uh, this old white woman, English woman came like walking towards us. I can't remember exactly what the situation was, but she started talking to us for some reason. And uh, then she was like, oh, um, your children, they all look the same. And, you know, this is kind of, you know, when we walked away, we were like, what was this about? <laughs> Our children don't look the same. They're all black, but, you know, they, you know, so this is kind of, you know, you don't know what hit you you know, <laughs> and uh, you don't know if she's just being, you know, innocent, you know, making a comment or if it's, you know, an actual microaggression, you know, so, um, yeah, but uh, like, uh, when I came to Iceland uh, with my daughter, um, I got, it, it was very different. Um, I, this was like during a time, this was in the 90s when um, adoption was very, popular in Iceland. Well, it was, you know, a, a lot of uh, um, people were adopting uh, children of Indian descent or, um, um, you know, people with, you know, children with dark skin. So I very often, I think I mentioned this before, I very often got the question, where is she from? And uh, <laughs> this is something that Sanna knows also, like, you know, like the adoption question. And uh, this kind of makes you question um, kind of um, the thing with uh, like 
dark-skinned children who get adopted by white families, um, they never have the option to kind of, you know, uh, being secretive about their adoption because they get asked this question all the time. Uh, and to me, to me, this is not even a microaggression. This is just, you know, quite brutal because children shouldn't have to discuss these things with people they don't know. Uh, I mean, my daughter is actually, you know, I gave birth to her, so, um, so this was different. But I mean, I mean, I have two daughters um, who have dark skin, so. Um, um, and they, they told me afterwards, like um, after they grew up, they're, they're both grown up now. So, uh, and then told me, I, you know, that they always kind of questioned if I was lying to them because they got asked this so, so many times that they kind of thought, you know, there was a period of time when I thought maybe you're lying to me, maybe you didn't actually give birth to me, you know, because you know, this, this is what goes through children's minds when they get asked the same question again and again and again. Um, so, I mean, like I said, microaggression, yes, but this has a long-term effect on people. And especially because I was a single mom also, like Sanna's mom. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, like I said, and, and I mean, we, we also, I mean, a lot of, uh, uh, we, we excuse something because it comes from other children. Um, but at the same time, I mean, my children are not really obliged to educate your children. So, um, you know, I, th I think this should be discussed a lot more in the education system also. This should be discussed a lot more in the schools. Um, because um, like, like how you talk to each other, you know, what is acceptable to ask people and so on and so forth. I don't know. But um, say, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go Jeff, it's okay. No, I was in Iceland specifically, you know, when I got here, what I was struck by is um, little kids. I have a soft spot for little kids because you know, I just, you know, my little cousins and, and, and kids in my family, I always tend to hang with them more because I, I don't know, we have the same brain. But uh, in Iceland, it like uh, I've noticed like uh, some kids would come up to me, a little kid might come up to me and the parents' faces would tell the kid if that was okay or not. And you would see it. And, and sometimes I've seen kids like, look at me like, like there's something curious here. I've never seen a person like this. And I'm curious to find out what's going on here. And then they look at their parents and their parents are like. <laughs> and the kid picks up on the, on the cue. And the kid's like, okay, well, I guess I can't go. Okay, all right, that's not gonna happen. I don't think that's, and I've seen this more times than I care to admit. And it really breaks my heart because kids are curious. They're, they're yeah. you know, you, you should encourage them to know their world. And I've seen more like, you know, them. one, one kid came up to me and was like pulling on my leg in like Toys R Us or something. Uh, so I bend down, I'm trying to talk to the kid and the lady comes over as if the kid slapped me in the head or something. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, it's, it's a kid. You know, kids do these things. It's, you know, no problem. And she's hurrying the kid off as if the kid did something wrong. And I'm like, kid didn't do anything wrong. It's, you know, it's what kids do. But these uh, little cues. And for me, I've noticed it in the eyes. I work in the hospital. And there are parts of the hospital that you need, you need um, credentials to get into. And I've walked through the hospital and I've gotten looks like, what are you doing here? I've had one of my colleagues who's from um, the Philippines get stopped. And <laughs> like, you're not supposed to be here. And he's like, I work here, <laughs> you know? And it's so like, wow, you know, um, you can't, your imagination doesn't go that far to think, well, maybe they work here. Um, I've, uh, you know, we have a, a changing area downstairs. 
and there's a male and female. And it, and it gives me anxiety to walk down there because I get looks like, what are you doing here? And, and I get actual, and these are people, what, what really bugs me sometimes is the people in the positions. It's like, if that's the way you are, uh, and think about the position you're in, you're supposed to help people no matter what, but you seem to have something in you that precludes you from doing that. I said to, um, when I had my kids in preschool, I noticed a lot of the preschool teachers, they're all Icelandic white women, and only one of them smiled. Now, smiling is a thing in Iceland, right, Sana? Right, Lenny? Yeah. Smiling is a thing. Now, in the States, <laughs> smiling is like, is like if you see a rabid dog and the dog's not wagging its tail, something's <laughs> watch that dog. And that's what smiling is to me. If you're not smiling, there's something, something, either you're, there's something negative going on, okay? Yeah. To me, that's just the culture in which I was raised because that's just how it is. Because most people will be, hey, how you doing? You go to the States, you visit the States, you'll know somebody's life story in five seconds. But when I went <laughs> and I brought my daughter into the preschool, I noticed none of the teachers were smiling. And it, and it disturbed me because I like have fun with kids. I have fun with my kids when I play with my kids. And, and, and they do silly things. And it's like, it's supposed, you're supposed to laugh, you know? So I said, to, and I was working as a cook in that particular school. So I went to the uh, principal and I said to her, I don't want any teachers around my daughter who doesn't smile. And she looked at me like I was crazy, but I was like, how can you be a preschool teacher around these little crazy little drunk people <laughs> and not crack a smile every now and then there's some and if you're that mad at your job you need to be in another job that was my thing to her and she's like oh they're not mad i'm like okay well what's with the resting face <laughs> there was one lady her name was Alsa, and i loved her to death because she came in bubbly she was like every day hi how you doing you know whatever my kids who used to always go up to people, no matter who came in, hi, 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 you know how kids do. And I would see some of the parents come in, some of these adults come in and totally ignore the kid. Just, and after a while, my kids stopped doing it. And it really broke my heart. Cause they, they now they, they were socialized to learn that you know, not everybody says hi, and some people just ignore you. Those little microaggressions are interesting because they teach us something. And it's like, well, what kind of society do you want to live in? And well, that's why that's why I think microaggressions and knowing about them, knowing that you can't really hide, you think you're hiding by not saying anything. But a normal person, we are human beings. We are made to interact with each other. We're not supposed to be alone. We weren't created to be alone. We're social creatures. So when you start being antisocial in your behaviors, whatever it be, is, when you start saying things to put somebody under uh, defensive or like, you know, these are microaggressions. These things create a society that you probably don't want to be in in the long run. If you if you play that out, that's my point. Well, I think microaggressions, like you were saying, I think but microaggressions lead to uh, real life aggression, uh, especially from what you and Loewe said. And unfortunately, children of color, uh, we get the brunt of it because um, like Loewe said, her children begin to question, could my mother, the person that I know, be telling me the truth? Uh, and this is your mom. And you've been questioned so much by people in society that you actually doubt she is telling you the truth. And I don't think white children have to go through life with so much doubt and things like that. And being asked, where are you really from? Are you adopted? Can I touch this part of you? Being sexualized with these stereotypes, this, this doesn't happen. Yeah, and so I, then you're forcing children of color, unfortunately, to grow up at a very rapid speed to, they don't know what adoption is. They now know about adoption. They're being asked about 
very inappropriate things for, I feel way too young for children of any age. And then the fact that it's very common amongst children of color to be asked these questions, this brings a microaggression to just an aggression because now at the age of nine or 10, you're like, I can't walk someone home because I'm black. What, what's so wrong with me? Yeah, it's, I mean, speaking of somebody who's white with white children, I think that the only thing that I've run into here uh, it has paled in comparison, right? It's, um, it's my kids being made fun of because their mother's Icelandic is terrible, right? I'm an immigrant, so I get like the immigrant stuff. Um, my kids, my daughter, and particularly, uh, although there's debate on my son's eye color, I think they're green. Everyone else thinks they're brown, but my daughter came home from Lake School A one day and was just like, she didn't want brown eyes anymore because everyone has blue eyes except the brown kids. They tend to have brown eyes. And I was like, where is all of this coming from? Right? Because uh, she has friends of different races. I have friends of different races. So it's not like she's not been exposed to it. But I was just, you know, like I read something deeper than like her not wanting to have brown eyes. Like to me, that's the start, right? Like if if you can't have brown eyes and you can't have brown skin. And so why like why is this not being cut off at the at the head, right? You know, like and so, I, you know, and you have to try and put that into the context of like, you know, on a, a four-year-old level um, and, and it, it has, it, it, I mean, it's just, a, it's a challenging discussion to have even on, on my end. Um, but I think the, the way I addressed it was that like one, her mother has brown eyes and does she think, does she not like her mother's eyes, right? because my eyes and her eyes are a lot alike. And then we went into other discussions about how like, you know, people come in all different colors and shapes and sizes and, you know, thinking and, and how, you know, like you have to really, you know, appreciate the differences that we all have. And like, it's hard to digest, like, you know, like to your point, Levy, about like, you know, now I'm explaining to my kids that they can trust me that I'm not adopted, right? Like, how do you put that into, uh, distill such a big concept down into like a four-year-old level? Um, and my kids, of course, like, it surprised me because it, my daughter was like four by this time and she's had friends of different ethnicities and races um, their entire childhood. And, um, and so I, it was just a surprise that it would suddenly matter, right? Like I remember when they were, when my son was two and, you know, he had like friends in the, in the Lake School who were uh, of different races. And, you know, we just acknowledged that that was awesome and okay, right? Nothing, nothing unusual about that. And then we went to the grocery store that afternoon and the gentleman at the cash register was black and my son being two points at him and goes, mommy, and he's black too. And like, of course, so he says it in English and he's, point, he's pointing to this guy. And I felt to your point, Jeff, about like, why do the parents kind of look away and what, what is that communicating? Like I was responding to my own embarrassment that my two-year-old son was probably making this person uncomfortable right and um and what i loved about this guy was he turned to my son and he points right back at him and he goes and you're white so what <laughs> just like such a you no know, see that's a good yeah. point and it's yeah. something my wife works in the schools and i've worked in the schools for a, a bit and it starts there it starts yeah. there when i worked in a preschool the kids that i came in contact with they didn't see, I don't think they, color was even in their thing. It was that, that's Jeff. He cooks the food that they, they never, they didn't even try to touch my hair. Um, there was a little kid. He wanted me to change his diaper because he liked me so much. It's like, that's mm -hmm. not something you, people you like, you ask them to do that. <laughs> I trust <laughs> but, you with my diaper. But, but uh, I, I mean, the first, the first year I was here, I remember walking down the street and, um, there was like 
three or four little kids. They're like six and seven. And they always looked at me. I used to, cause I used to put in the little walkways with the little bricks and stuff. And so I see these kids coming back and forth to school. So the third time, one of the kids, you see him talking with his buddies and he gets up the nerve, you know? And he comes up to me and he goes, Hey, Hey, where, where are you from? And I was like, I'm from the States, you know? He's like, Oh, Oh, I, I have an uncle. I have an uncle. He lives in the States. And I was like, okay. And you know, and then he starts telling me, you know, and then his other friends start coming over. And they're like, oh, gee, I guess, I guess you can't talk to the black guy. Let's, let's go see what's going on. So they all come over. So I got this little crowd, like three or four little seven-year-olds. And they're asking me questions like, so um, um, you play basketball? I was like, no, no, I, I don't really, I don't really play the basketball. Do you like to rap? Do you, do you rap? I was like, no, I, I don't. I, I like rock, but uh, I, don't, I don't rap much. It, oh, okay. They're kind of disappointed. Right? <laughs> they maybe maybe, maybe if I rapped or played basketball, something would, you know, or whatever. And then he asked me, uh, he says, uh, but you know, um, why, why are you brown? Why are you brown? I said, well, you know, people come in different uh, shades. I said, you know, uh, maybe someone you know gets brown in the summer. You know, people tan sometimes, right? He's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. I guess so. But what? But why are you brown? <laughs> so I think. Yeah, I think we, are, we need to like question whiteness also and be like critical towards whiteness because that is something we don't emphasize like um, here or you know really never because that is something that you know theoretically people have been emphasizing because white is always the norm. It never gets yes. you to say like oh. You brought I'm that up in your talk. Yeah, oh, like oh, you're white. Boy. She's white, you know, you just like look out for a white friend, then you notice her. But you always like state it if you're going to meet a friend and it's like, oh, yeah, she's a little dark, you know, she's, she's black, you know, something like that. <laughs> and then when you're like, uh, it's socialized and everything like um, skin colored crayon or you're going to look for pantyhose under your dress, they're skin colored or you're going to get like makeup in a drugstore, it's skin colored or you're going to go and... Um, get your hair cut and they only know how to cut white hair or you know not white hair but not like your textured hair or something like that so everything is kind of like around you telling you you don't fit in you don't belong and also the color of your skin uh, decides how people are going to treat you or like say okay this person doesn't understand Icelandic I'm just going to decide that now and be like hey can I help you and you're like nay I'm just looking around and like continue in like yep. English and you're like I speak Icelandic and they still continue or they speak to you in English and your friend in Icelandic and you're like what's going on I can understand this should be embarrassing for him and this is like something people were talking about I don't know if this qualifies as like a micro or macro oh it certainly I think it certainly is my my answer to those young uh, fellows though was I told them if you had a rainbow and it was just one color, would it be a rainbow? And would it be interesting to look at? And he goes, no. He goes, oh, okay. So that's why there's different color. There's different kinds of people. I'm like, yeah. It's like, just like there's different kinds of colored flowers in the field. It really makes it look interesting, right? He's like, yeah, that's right. And I was like, yeah. now we're on to something. But that's but, a really good point, right? About well, Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's natural. That's at I was schooling. trying to point out to him that it was a natural. It's natural that people are different, but as I think most that, things are. I think that adults miss that opportunity, right? Like, it's natural for children to be curious when they see something that's different than them, right? Like, or different than their experience in their household. And instead of, like, there's a way, there's a way to acknowledge that difference without having to make it, like, an issue. Like, why can't we just make it a positive, you know, a thing, right? Like with these kids at, at my daughter's school, um, you know, there must have been some sort of discussion about, you know, the kids that had the brown eyes versus the kids that have the blue eyes, or right? blue being the dominant eye color in this society. And, you know, like a missed opportunity for the teachers, I think, would be like, 
isn't it so cool? Like that she is brown and she is green and she has blue and she like, and just make it, you know, just seize the opportunity to make it positive. I mean, I try to do that here just in, in my own house. Like whenever the kids see something that's different than they're used to, uh, instead of encouraging them viewing it as weird, you know, we try to, we try to say like, well, yeah, like, let's Google something around the world. Like the whole world is not built like Iceland is, right? Like the, our society is just the way the society is here, but globally around the world, you're actually a minority, right? Like, and, it, and it's, um, I just think it's a missed opportunity at a very small level to kind of eliminate microaggressions be before they turn into those macroaggressions. When people say, why, you know, what are you doing here? Or, or why did you come here? What, something like that. It always strikes me funny because a lot of, I mean, white people go to Africa, they go to India, they go everywhere, but they never stop the question, should I be there? Or, or, or is it a problem that I'm here? You see what I'm saying? It's like, it's a very interesting thing in the mind. And that's why I always thought, you know, like this white beaten uh, supremacy idea is so cognitively messed up. Because it's like, I said to my wife, I says, have you ever walked into a place? And you may have being a woman, if, but have you ever walked into a place and been the only one and instantly felt something? And, um, you know, some women might have felt, might, you, Paula, you could probably say that if you walk into a business meeting, there's all men and they see you walk in and instantly they're, they're, th they're putting all kinds of stuff on you instantly. That you know, it's probably not even you or your personality, but they've already judged you before you even open your mouth. Have you ever felt that walking into a boardroom as a woman? I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I think that that's an entirely different Zoom. <laughs> probably, we, probably. We talked about, the, we about, about like, that a little bit, like on a, on a on a prep call. We talked about the fact that you know, like uh, in a social setting, you know women are conditioned to try to be attractive right present our best selves but in a business setting if you're if you present yourself as attractive um then it's your fault that you're getting the un, unsolicited attention um that you're getting and how you know one of the things i said to jeff was that over the years i've um i've been in conflict with myself just as you know on a gender level of like in business i take on this kind of you know, like I, I kind of put up walls to make myself less or make myself just not attractive in certain settings. Um, and then immediately after I go out to some social setting and then I just don't feel like attractive enough, right? And so, I mean, I think that there's, there's all kinds of issues with that. And there's microaggressions at work. I've been subjected to them. I was just talking to in a group about that yesterday about when I was pregnant uh, with my daughter a new CEO had come into the company that I was in and, you know, uh, we were all just randomly discussing how many, how long we'd been at that particular company. And I was like, I think I've been here about almost three years now. And the CEO turns to me and says, well, you've been either pregnant or on maternity leave that whole time. So like, you know, and I've talked uh, in small doses about some of the experiences that I've had in business here in Iceland, like uh, on paper, and I, I feel I've been quite successful here, but at the same time with that success has come, I've been exhausted by the microaggressions that I have had to deal with, one as an immigrant and two as a woman, uh, particularly in the tech sector. Um, but I also am fully aware, and because, you know, like you, I'm fully aware that I've had opportunities that other people haven't had because I'm a white American woman who's from a middle-class family and had opportunities that by the time I moved here, I had already leveraged, right? And because people like my husband and he's, he's a nice guy, he gets along with like everyone. So when I was going in for opportunities, people were like, oh, she's married to that Greemer guy, right? Well, she, well, he's okay, so she must be okay. Um, no. And I know that there's opportunities that other people didn't have as a result of that, but it, yeah, it is exhausting. There's a lot of gender stuff I've had to deal with at work. Now, since Sana, since you are here and you are a first, 
So I'm really curious because as someone who has children of blended background, I always, it, 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 it's heartening to me that you are in the position you're in here um, because I felt a little a pull for my kids to see someone who looks like them in any kind of position. And I know if we were in the States, they would see it all the time. They would see mayors, Congress people, you know, they would see it. Police people, police chiefs, uh, business owners, they would see it. And I can expose them to that. But here they do not as much. And being a first, I would like to know how has that and these microaggressions we're talking about, have what have you had to have you had to overcome any of this being the first and being someone who is Icelandic? How, I mean, I can imagine dealing with that would personally, I'm sorry, that would piss me off. But I, I would I'm curious about how, how you deal with it or dealt with it. Yeah, uh, becoming a city councillor in Reykjavik, I actually thought like during the campaign, I actually prepared myself like, okay, now you're really going to see like, you, you have to prepare yourself for racism, you have to prepare yourself that you're going to hear some nasty things said about you just be like open towards the fact that that is going to happen. But I wasn't aware of it. Um, and I was like, Oh, okay. Um, and I was like, okay, that's what that isn't what I was expecting. And then I started to think, why isn't this happening? Because over the years, I have experienced this whole kind of like, you don't look Icelandic experience where you're from, uh, explain, sorry, where you're from. But then I started thinking, because during the campaign, I was opening myself up towards people and in, in television, radio, and I was telling people that I had uh, lived in Iceland with my mom. She had worked two jobs and we had lived in poverty. So I started thinking like, okay, do people maybe see me like, okay, her and her mom, they are really Icelandic. They know the Icelandic struggle. They kind of know what it's like to live in hardship. They are like truly the real story of this kind of like, um, because Iceland, this is like, definitely a topic for another show, show, I don't know here or maybe somewhere else, but if I can sum it up and hopefully it um, makes some sense, but I think the Icelandic kind of history is based on um, the strong individual making it out of hard, difficult times. And um, if you can do that, then you really can say that you, you know, belong here. I don't know if it makes sense. But then I started thinking like, oh, okay, do people see me as this kind of young girl uh, living with her mother and, oh, okay, she gets the Icelandic kind of like, okay, yes, approved. And also because I have my mom's last name, um, the Icelandic naming tradition here is usually that you take the father's last name and then you are either like the daughter or the son of your father um, you can be the daughter of the son of your mom and your father or sometimes it's um, you can like take the name of your mother but um, it's been changing now regarding to equality and people want to reference both the parents um, but I'm 28 so if you hear about someone that is like 30 or 40 or 50 that um, has the last name referencing to a mother, then it's kind of like, oh, okay, single mom issue kind of thing going on. So if you hear like an Icelandic last name that is not like a family name, just regarding to this Icelandic name, I'm like the daughter of Marta, then people are like, oh, okay, she's Icelandic. So I don't have like my Tanzanian father's last name. So people aren't like, oh, okay, she's like brown with a foreign name. She should just like go back to Africa. And also um, people had a real difficulty saying my name, it's Icelandic, but I was the first Icelander to get the name. I needed to get 
approval from the naming committee, long story, but it's not a typical Icelandic name. So people were like, Sunna, Sara, Stella, I don't understand, you know, the skin color is like making my ears, you know, bleh, I can't hear you. Um, but after I took seat in the city council, this has been like easier for people to understand. So this is something that I have been experiencing that people are, um, this exposure, if you can call it that, has made it easier for people to kind of like, oh yeah, she's the Sana, you know, the poor girl that used to live in Breholt, you know, she's one of us. So that's been my experience. That's also a microaggression. People, uh, white people saying people of color's names incorrectly and acting like this is now the hardest thing they have ever heard on the planet. And as a foreigner coming to Iceland, I, there were a lot of names. I was like, what? I'm sorry, can you say it again and again? And you know, I feel rude. And for them, they're like, it's so easy. And I go, my name is Asantawa. What? Can I call you something else? No, you can call me Asantawa. If I can learn Sigurd, I can learn all these names. So Hildur, you can learn Asantawa. <laughs> I mean, for me, this is, um, I think it's very, I didn't know that your name was new. So to me, uh, your name is Icelandic. And I, but I definitely see this as a microaggression where it's, they see your name and then, oh, she's brown. How do you say it? Say it again, spell it. Is this Icelandic? Um, and I think it's great that you are being a uh, representative for many Icelandic people of color and that you correct them every time you say your name incorrectly. <laughs> yeah, and I think that this is, I mean, what Jeff was saying before about being asked if he can play basketball or rap, you know, this is the only representation that black people have in Iceland, really. So, um, and I mean, I struggled with this bringing up my children because um, I was trying to find like TV material, and other stuff that, you know, had people that looked like them in it. And um, I always had to, like, I couldn't just turn on the TV. I had to kind of struggle to look for something that was positive. And uh, yeah, with representation. And also, you know, they couldn't look to Althinki or city council or, you know, have black people on their TV doing normal stuff, you know, doing interviews or, you know, so this is very much lacking in Iceland. Luckily, it's it's slowly changing, but yeah. There was something it's, that Loy, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, um, so I think maybe in this, the bigger scheme of things, uh, I think I see a bigger part of it is definitely breaking those molds and not pigeonholing people of color because this is, um, and I'd also like to say Jeff's son was on a billboard. Was mm -hmm. it for Icewear? Was that icewear, Jeff? I can't remember. It was for Zoan. Zoan. Um, yeah. See, the things like that, mm -hmm. um, where people of color are seen as these one-dimensional characters that play basketball, listen to rap music, mm -hmm. have big chains, curse each other out. I don't know. Um, we are so much more than that. And these microaggressions definitely stem from that. They stem from us just being rappers and basketball players. And this is what children see. And this is how we get these questions when we are so much more than that. We are city council members and chefs and models on billboards. Absolutely. <laughs> and there's oh, still oh, a and, lot. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Paula. No, I was just going to say that there's still a lot to be done to even like beyond Iceland. I mean, in the States, you were just starting to see um, people of color, Black, Native, Amer Native American, um, uh, Asian, various Asian leads, whether South Asian or uh, Chinese, Korean, and J Japanese, and so on, like, they're just starting to take lead roles. Um, and and it's, it's great to see this shift and stop putting, to your point, Sante, you know, like these, if feeling, just continuing that trope, just rolling forward, and, and seeing just, uh, people from diff different ethnicities, different races, different religions, and representing them as holistic beings instead of, uh, you know, just that, that basketball player, that rapper, or, you know, the woman who's the, the supporting housewife or whatever the ongoing tropes are. And it's, it, it's not just in Iceland, it's 
it's everywhere. It just seems to me to be more um, obvious here, right? I mean, as life as an experience, the one thing that struck me in the last couple of years was, I, I think it was a comedian who said to me something about like, and, and it's really clear here in Iceland that you can grow up and your teacher is white and you go to school and the majority of people around you are white. The people you look up to the most in your life are white. You marry somebody, they're white. Their family's white. Uh, you live, you die, you have white children. And at the end of your life, it's like you didn't miss a thing. And it was all white. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that profound to me. Like, like wow, because that, it would never be, it hasn't been my experience. And I can't imagine that being my experience. Like if I grew up and the only real person or people of influence around me were black, I, I, I don't know how that would make me or how my life view or view of the value of other people. If, if, if I could grow up and the only people that I saw of any value to me were those who looked like me. I mean, you're describing almost every single person that I grew up with. Yeah, I was I gonna mean, say that like, like a white person. <laughs> Ninety, yeah, ninety-eight point nine percent white Catholic towns, twenty-five minutes south of Boston, and like I don't know how I grew up in that same town, and what my, like what either paths I took or or serendipity I ended up with, that I ended up with diverse bosses, uh, coworkers, friends, you know, I just, I don't understand like why, why this, these other people that grew up in my town didn't have those, for, the only thing I can surmise from it is that it was just like active ignorance or, or active avoidance of, of widening your view of life and perspectives. I mean, like, the town that I grew up in, from what I'm seeing on social media, which it, of course obviously isn't always the best representation of things, but like a, a lot of them seem to have been, you know, backing the president that caused an insurrection, right? Like, and that blows my mind because we all we all started in the same place, and there's there's well, plenty of that. That kind of goes to the point that if the yeah. only people you see of value in your life are those that look like you yeah then every stereotype and racist thing can be validated in a way yeah. and you wouldn't and and that kind of makes it easier to see for people who don't understand or or they don't know where people are coming from it's like when i was in the navy i talked about this in, in the speech and i'll wrap it up but uh, there's a guy i met from texas who's in, from a small town in texas and it was always, and the thing that kills me about the whole Trump thing, it's always the poor guys who are going to lose their life for the rich white guy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we're all there. And he goes, you know, I never talked to anyone. All black people were the N word to me. He goes, my town, it, it's all white people. And he loved talking to me so much because First of all, it was nothing of what any stereotype is. I listen to jazz, classical, I, you know, I know what Shakespeare is, I understand Shakespeare. I mean, it's like, it's a whole different thing. So he was like, you know, and then he said to me, you're not black. And I said, no, I am. <laughs> That's the whole point. It's like black isn't a thing. Just like white isn't a thing. It's like, there's no one white mythical person just because it's a color there is it's karen it's like you know there's so many different yeah well yeah it's karen there you go there see now you stepped in it i didn't say it <laughs> just kidding. Dante, sorry i didn't say it i didn't say it girlfriend <laughs> that was okay. what i'm saying you know it's 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 um it's when you when you are in and you get to experience life in all its fullness and diversity. I mean, if you, listen, if you have a problem with someone else, if you're Icelandic and you have a problem with someone else, stay in Iceland, never, never go anywhere. Don't go to Spain, don't go anywhere. You're, you're great right where you are. But if you do, 
ask yourself, why do I do that then? Why is that a good thing for me? Why is it nice for me? How dare because you deny them of that that's anything? What that's what <laughs> it's meant to be. I, I hate to like have to defend myself and I've had to do it with people who are so far right that they are going in circles. I don't know. And it's like, because it's only like the truth is what it is because we are all meant to be, uh, to grow. We're all meant to grow. We don't stay kids. Our worldview doesn't remain just our crib. And if, and if it did, imagine what kind of person we'd be. And that would be Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that in there. So to wrap up tonight's episode on that note, um, thank you everyone for contributing. And how do we all, <clears throat> I guess, how, do, how, have, how has this conversation um, influenced your thoughts on how you can change microaggressions in your life, I guess, starting with you, because I don't have that much societal sway, I don't think. All right, I'll go. Yeah, okay, Jeff. Because I'm the only man here, I feel outnumbered. <laughs> Why me? I feel weak. No, I'm okay. <laughs> no, microaggressions. For me, I try to shut up, that's all. I, I really, I, I really like to try to shut up and, and observe and, and speak less uh, and also think more about being in the other person's shoes, especially if there's someone I don't know, if it's someone I don't know. I just feel like you're walking into this one. Okay. Um, okay. Who would like to go next? <laughs> you did it. You did it to yourself. <laughs> Shall I go next? Um... Yeah, um, I just wanted to, um, I mean, I remember um, seeing th this story, I can't remember if it was some uh, something, uh, some article or something about these, uh, like, elderly couple uh, who were mixed, I think they were British, um, but they were like, uh, you know, a mixed couple who had been together you know, all their lives, basically. They had met when they were very young. And uh, it was like a beautiful, positive story about their relationship and so on and so forth. And um, for me, just looking at these people who were like, you know, 70, in their 70s or something, and seeing their story, and I physically cried because um, having been in mixed relationships myself, I know like the hardships you have to go through and all these microaggressions that these relationships are exposed to. And um, for me, this is kind of sums up the way, I mean, there's so much like being in a mixed relationship is always fetishized so much by other people. Like they, don't, nobody expects it to last. Uh, people think it's all about something else than just for two people falling in love. And then, you know, with the, you know, having children and all this, you know, it's uh, like what we've been talking about basically here is that uh, those relationships, I mean, that's why there's so many um, single mothers who have mixed race children is because these relationships, they are under heavy pressure. And uh, this is all, you know, the society that we have to live in. <laughs> So um, I, th I think this is uh, maybe some food for thought that, um, and also just what our children have to go through, going through life. And um, yeah, and I think Sanna's paper very much sums that up for us. So, yeah. I, I used to always uh, think like I had to, explain to people like when they asked me in the street like where are you from I was like okay yeah of course I need to explain this person is asking me for obvious reasons I should just like you know be friendly and explain and all of a sudden I was just like standing in the street telling some stranger about how my mom and dad met and how I hadn't spoken to my dad in a long time and you know that my parents weren't together now and this, you know, story 
about you know the sad story of uh, dad abandonment and that I'd never been to Africa and I hadn't found my roots and that you know my dad had never met to Iceland and yes my mom and dad met in London and no they weren't married and you know drawing up this whole kind of family tree and now my approach is kind of like hey you've got to protect yourself am I ready to go into this whole dialogue with someone that doesn't even know my name and if I tell them my name are they going to be able to pronounce it so I'm just like okay so sometimes I'm playful with it I'm like oh yeah I'm from you know I'm from uh, you know where it is in Iceland, you know, it's at the top of Iceland. <laughs> and when they're like, no, no, where are you really from? I'm like, I'm really, you know, from the womb of my mom, <laughs> just like to play with people and see how far along they're going to take it just to, just to like, you know, try and make them see how ridiculous this is. Um, and, um, but I think education is also sometimes the thing I try to do more of and regarding like racial microaggressions I try to talk about race as a social construct um, and how you know if you would take for example a racial group that you would see as one group you know a bunch of black people and a bunch of white people you would see more um, if you would look at their genes whatever you call it there's like more different yeah it's like yeah we're basically just um we're pretty much all the same on the inside pretty much you can't like divide people into different uh, different groups and be like oh yeah you should be able to rap you should be able to you know sing like beyonce or something or twerk you should be good at those things like no <laughs> so i think yeah Sometimes, sometimes education and sometimes it's okay to be just like, yeah, you know what? I'm just tired now. It's not my job to do it. Just like Google it <laughs> and be like, ah, no, I don't, I don't understand. No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I, I think I touched on this a little bit. Um, it's really just taking, it starts like young, right? And taking the opportunity when a child notices a difference between what they are accustomed to and what they're seeing either for the first time or or whatever and um you know unless it's dangerous like celebrate it right and and i think that that's so important to changing uh view viewpoints um you know for somebody like me who grew up like i said in a 98 point whatever percent white catholic town um, it's taken a long time to unravel things that I didn't know, uh, biases I didn't know I had as a result of that. Um, like just things I did not know. Um, and I've, you know, grown to accept the fact that I'm going to like, you know, have moments where I put my foot in my mouth and then I just have to take that lesson. And I think that a lot of people don't take the lesson. They just react and they want I think we we talked about it in one of our prep calls like we want other people to make us comfortable about you know our stupid moment or like you know or when we've said something offensive we want the person who we've offended to 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 take on that burden instead of ourselves and I think that if we start taking on that burden ourselves as painful as it can be it's always going to be a lot less painful than the person who you've offended um, I think that that's really important. And I think from like a gender, perspe gender perspective, um, I've had a lot of experiences here in Iceland that I wasn't expecting to have both positively and then from a gender, gender microaggression, macroaggression, very negative, um, which surprised me for the number one country for gender equality. And I get really triggered by them and they continue to happen. And I've become less and less tolerant of making that other person feel comfortable about you know them making an offensive remark to me and i do that both for my own mental health and i do that for the example i might be setting to somebody else who doesn't feel that they have their power to do that um so uh yeah if you say something really sexist you can pretty much guarantee i'm going to push back on it um 
And, and I think that that's really important. And depending on how egregious it is, I'll either do it in a cordial way where I guide out of the, the problem, or if you're just an ass, <laughs> you kind of need to have that like, you know, hey, wake up kind of moment. So um, yeah, I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts on that, but maybe it's for a different Zoom. Okay. Thank you everyone for contributing tonight and thank you for everyone watching Work in Progress again and we'll see you on the next episode. Have a good night.